I've been asked to speak today about uh, endocervical cells in a pap smear, their significance, and uh, problems that I've encountered in my practice in being sure that they're there on, the, on a pap collection and what that means uh, clinically. Why is it important that a pap smear be collected in a very specific anatomic location and in a very specific manner? Meaning, if we get samples here, why is that not a, as good as a sampling that occurs here in terms of screening for cervical cancer? If we were to look at this region of the uterus, the endocervical canal, in a microscope, it has very specialized columnar cells that produce mucus. We have to mention uh, uh, this very specific arrow here, and that is where the inside, where the endocervical cells meet the outside, the squamous cells multi-layered here. This very specific anatomic location has a name, and there's, it has several names. Clinically, it's referred to as the transformation zone. You'll see this in the charts written TZ, or on a requisition. It's also, it's also called the squamo-columnar junction, or SCJ. You'll see that on requisitions and charts as well. And does it make sense? Squamous, columnar, where they come together is the squamo-columnar junction. Okay? And you'll hear me uh, oftentimes refer to it as the target zone. Instead of transformation zone, TZ, TZ being the target zone, this is the target that should be aimed for when a pap test is collected. It's just inside, usually just inside the opening of the os. Now, okay. understand that this point, this anatomic location, is slightly different in every woman. And it varies with age. Such that if the tips of my fingers represent the squamo-columnar junction in a woman, is everybody following me here, the tips of my fingers? Okay. In a woman's lifetime, when she is young, the squamo-columnar junction is higher in the endocervical canal. It's up here. Okay. As she matures and her menses begin, it actually drops. And by the time she's 19, it's right here near the os. When she becomes pregnant, the uterus enlarges. And the endocervical canal, the, the squamo-columnar junction, actually opens up some. The os opens up as because of the size of the uterus. And the squamo-columnar junction actually moves out here onto the ectocervix. Postpartum, it moves back inside, but with each birth, it goes out and comes back, but not to where it was before. So that a woman that has had several children, her squamo-columnar junction may be out on the ectocervix. I had a circle with a dot for the nulliparous cervix. For a woman that's had multiple children, the os is no longer a small little opening like this, it's more, it's a tr usually transverse uh, opening. Oh. When <clears throat> a speculum is inserted and opened, the person performing a pap smear is making an assessment. What does the cervix look like? Where is the squamo-columnar junction? Which instrument should I use to sample the squamo-columnar junction, this very specific anatomic site? Which instrument works best? So if the squamo-columnar junction is out here and the sample is collected by deep insertion of an endocervical brush uh, with twisting, with the thought that, oh, I'm sampling the squamo-columnar junction, it's removed and they've missed the squamo-columnar junction completely for a woman, a multiparous woman who has ectropion of 360 degrees. The best instrument is the old-fashioned air spatula. The, sp the air spatula, do you see, will sample the squamo-columnar junction here. Or 
use of the mop, do you see how the mop, too, collect ectropion? Because it hits the spot. All right, the next question is, why? Why is the squamal columnar junction the point of interest? Why is it the target zone? And it turns out that this is a very metabolically active uh, <coughs> area that because we've said it can retreat and expand, it, it constantly moves in a woman's lifetime. It's also exposed to the flora of the vagina and there's inflammation that occurs as a normal process here. These inflammatory changes that will cause nuclei to become active, their, their little RNA factories go to work, they're doing what they're supposed to, the nuclei may enlarge, but this is all part of the, the activity that is going on here all the time. And sometimes the squamous epithelium that normally lines the ectocervix will move inward in a process known as metaplasia where you have replacement of one cell type by another. The endocervical cells become replaced by squamous cells and they have a very distinctive appearance. We can see them in a pap smear. We can see the metaplastic cells that occur here but it turns out that that metaplastic process is susceptible to neoplastic change, meaning we have in a young woman a very abrupt junction, but in the course of her lifetime, as things go back and forth, there are metaplastic changes here that with other influences, viral infection, cigarette smoking, uh, all the risk factors known for cervical cancer, these cells can transform into ca cancerous cells. And so to evaluate for the presence of cancer or its early precursors, that's where we have to sample. All right, so now comes the point of the talk. What indicator do we have that the sample did indeed come from here? Well, the only indicator we have, there's not, there's not a test, there's not a molecular probe, uh, there's not something that you can put on to a litmus paper or pH stick and say, yes, this came from the squamal columnar junction. The only thing that we have is what we see, what's present on the slide. And traditionally, the, the thinking has been <clears throat> that if you have endocervical cells on the slide, it means that your collection device was not only present at the squamal columnar junction, but even up a little further, and therefore, the sample would be, quote, adequate. Does that make sense? So if you have these cells on the slide, the thinking was you've, you've done what you're supposed to. All right, so now I'm just going to point out how that's not always true. All right, how you can have on a slide nothing but endocervical cells and not have sampled the squamous squamocolumnar junctions. Say, I'll say it again. You look at the slide, pure endocervical cells. The, in the old way of thinking is, oh, good sample. Not only did they get one or two or three collections of five preserve, well-preserved cells, they've got me a million endocervical cells. Got to be a great sample, right? Well, what if it came from a multiparous woman, a woman who's had several children, and her squamocolumnar junction is out here? We need to have a sample from the transformation zone. And if the patient has ectropion, then this kind of collection is going to miss that. Does that make sense? So that points out just a flaw in, the th in our thinking of endocervical cells present, all is good. Well, people have now studied this. And what they found is that in these big studies where they look at whether or not endocervical cells were present on the slide and who actually ended up having abnormalities. In carefully controlled studies where they follow patients over years, they'll go back and look at several pap smears over a period of time and say, you know, this woman came in five years in a row, 
she uh, <coughs> had endocervical cells on each collection and she did or did not have cervical cancer. And looking at that, they've found that uh, presence of endocervical cells is not necessarily needed in order to find the abnormalities that uh, are present in a pap test and which uh, over time you eventually discover. So it may not be present one year, but the next year it will be. And that's how the pap test began. It was Dr. Papanicolaou understood the limitations of making everything right. You get the right place. It's at the right time in a, in a woman's cycle. You get the cells, in the old days, they didn't rush, rinse it into fixative. They smeared it on a slide. You get that down in just the right layer. You fix it immediately. The technologist who looks at it is having a good day. <laughs> uh, and they find the two little cells that are present on that, among hundreds of thousands in one corner of the slide. He knew that that was, a, that was the key to making the test work, but if something went wrong along any of the, of the steps that I just outlined, then the understanding was bring her back next year and it's regular interval testing. I'll say that again, regular interval testing. That's what matters in terms of long-term discovery and screening for uh, cervical cancer.